of the Board of uh, Deputies. Uh, thank you very much for coming here today. You are our first um, major witness, if I can put it like that, in our inquiry into anti-Semitism. Uh, and I'd like to start with uh, a general question, Mr. Arkash, which is, do you think that anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic attacks are on the increase in Britain today? Well, on the basis of the figures compiled by the Metropolitan Police, um, in 2015 there were about uh, 500 anti-Semitic incidents. On the basis of figures compiled by the Community Security Trust, from whom I think you're going to hear, we are. and they are the experts and have produced uh, detailed figures with a, a methodology they have used for about the past 25 years, there were something like a thousand incidents and that was the third highest on record, um, or the second highest on record. And the figures have not come down very much since 2014 when there was a spike at the time of the Gaza campaign. So um, I think the figures have shown a slight and welcome fall since 2014, but they're still stubbornly high. And why do you think they are on the increase? You, you sit as the head of one of the most respected bodies uh, representing individuals in any religion. Um, you must have conducted your own research on this and obviously you have uh, an enormous network in the community. Why do you think this is happening and where is the failure of the, the state in particular to deal with this problem? Well, traditionally, um, anti-Semitism has come from the far right and we're not seeing very much far right activity at the moment. Uh, traditionally, there has always uh, been prejudice against Jews coming from the far left as well. Uh, and I think with the uh, advent of a more leftward tilt in the leadership of the Labour Party, some people feel that a space has opened up for them, or they feel emboldened to say things which previously they felt they could not say in polite society. And I think that partly explains uh, some of the statements uh, made by people in the Labour Party, although I, I do emphasise it's not by any means restricted to the Labour Party. I'll come to the Labour Party in a second, if I may, because yes. this is one can of I, the areas can I, would you, I just wanted to add to that. Um, a significant part of the incidents come from people uh, who are who, or who are appear to be from areas in the Muslim communities. Uh, and I want to emphasise that the overwhelming majority of British Muslims, and I spend quite a lot of time meeting them in mosques and Islamic centres because it's been a priority of mine, uh, are, 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 they are moderate and law-abiding and they're not prejudiced uh, in the main. But there are some quarters who are very prejudiced and I think they may get information or prejudice passed down through mosques or schools or literature or Muslim subscription TV channels of an extreme nature coming from abroad. Sure. We'll come to more of that in a second, but help me to define one, what anti-Semitism is. The definition of anti-Semitism adopted by the European Monitoring Centre on Racism and Xenophobia in 2015 includes the denial of the right of Jewish people to self-determination. Do you believe that it is anti-Semitic to question the morality of the establishment of the State of Israel, because I think that is, in a sense, part of the defense of those who say they're not anti-Semitic. They just don't like what the State of Israel is doing. Do you accept that definition, or well, to yes. help us, do you have a better definition that could frame our inquiry? Well, at, at, at its simplest level, anti-Semitism is prejudice, racial prejudice directed against Jewish people. But that, of course, needs to be expanded a certain amount because there's lots of different behaviours within that. What the European Union Monitoring Committee did, and they called it a working definition as opposed to something cast in stone, uh, was to group together uh, various behaviours which they regarded as uh, exhibiting anti-Semitism. And uh, the fundamental rights agency is now the agency concerned and more recently the intergovernmental um, 
International um, Holocaust Remembrance Association, on which, of course, this country is represented, uh, has adopted the um, EU MC definition with a tiny change in wording that doesn't really change anything. So, yes, we do regard the EU MC working uh, definition as helpful and comprehensive and fit for purpose. So if somebody says, I don't believe the State of Israel has a right to exist, they would be anti-Semitic. If they said that we don't believe in uh, nationalism uh, as translated by uh, the right to self-determination of any people, then I wouldn't regard that as anti-Semitic. And I suppose it is a um, it could be a coherent point of view. Um, but based on the right of self-determination being a fundamental human right recognised in the Charter of the United Nations, then if they withhold the right of determination solely to Jewish people, right. but not to anyone else, then I would question, yes, why it is that they're singling out Jewish people for that exceptional That's treatment. That's very helpful. So specifically about the state of Israel, mm. they would be anti-Semitic and obviously anti-Zionist as well. Yes, Zionism is the right of they Jewish say, people self-determination. So if they say, I don't want anyone to be to have self-determination. Yes. If you know the people of Pakistan call themselves the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, mm. for example, yes. or you know, the Republic of Iran, mm. um, if it's for the whole world, it's fine. But if it's specifically about Israel, then they would be anti-Semitic. We would say so, yes. We question anywhere where you single out Jews for one particular treatment that you don't accord to other peoples. Sure. And just one more on the foreign policy aspect. But people are free to criticise... Um, Benjamin Netanyahu and um, other Prime Ministers and former Prime Ministers of Israel about what Israel does in Gaza without being accused, for example, what it does or does not do, I should say, uh, in Gaza, without fear of being called anti-Semitic or anti-Zionist. Yes, indeed. And uh, no one criticises uh, the government of Israel more than Israelis themselves. And just as you can criticise a policy of the government of this country or any country, uh, we have and never have had any problem with criticism of one or other policy of the government of the State of Israel. This is a very, very vibrant democracy, and one only has to watch the way political discussion is conducted in Israel, including in the Knesset Parliament, you'll realise that criticism is alive and well in the State of Israel. Indeed. Alive and well and exciting. <laughs> Um, probably too exciting for no, some politicians. You, you, you took us to the Labour Party, so let's concentrate on some of the things that you've said about uh, indeed the far right and the far left. Let's, let's be fair on this. Uh, for example, in respect of Donald Trump's visit to the United Kingdom on the 22nd of June, you stated that Mr. Trump's recent comments have been divisive and troubling mm. and that he has not moved decisively enough to distance himself from extremist supporters. Mm. Is that what you describe as the right? Well, I, I'm not sufficiently expert in United States politics, but uh, I, when I was talking about the right, I was talking about domestic politics in this country, that it's certainly not unknown to find uh, racism directed against Jews from uh, parts of the political world on the right of this country. In relation to the United States, uh, I guess Donald Trump is on the right, and yes, we are very troubled by some of the things he said recently. And you think that they might be anti-Semitic? Or are no, no, uh, we were referring to his um, getting embroiled in uh, racial stereotyping about Mexicans, for example, most recently with the Mexican judge. So let us now move to the left uh, and the comments made by Ken Livingston, who is going to be one of our witnesses later on this mm. afternoon. What troubles you about what he has said? Because he's made quite a, a strong defence of his views and he has tabled a paper to this committee today talking about all the work he's done with the Jewish community while he was Mayor of London. Mm -hmm. What troubles you about him? Is it because he used the word Hitler? Is it because you think he is anti-Semitic himself? What is, what is it that, that troubles you about what he said? For example, obviously he's not the only person who may have made such comments, but let's use him since he is, he's coming to give evidence to us today and we can put it back to him. Well, in the old days, people from the far right would try to smear Jews by accusing them of being communists. 
Now we're seeing some times where people on the far left are trying to smear Jews by saying that they behave like Nazis. What troubles me about Ken Livingstone is that his history was completely wrong and false. Um, we will be sending your committee, if you wish, and I have some copies here to leave, some pieces by respected historians who have uh, shown that uh, Lenny Brenner, whose book I think is what Mr Livingstone relies on, to be a totally false and distorted version of history. Uh, and I've got articles from The Guardian and the, uh, and the BBC saying exactly the same thing from other very well-known and respected genuine academics. Lenny Brenner is not a genuine academic. He's a Marxist academic with a political axe to grind. Now, I don't know whether Mr Livingstone knew or did not know of the falsity of his source textbook, but what I'm absolutely sure about is that in saying that uh, Zionists, which we regard as a code word for Jewish, at any rate, most Jews are Zionists, they believe in the right of self-determination, uh, were uh, like Nazis, uh, he was being deliberately offensive and uh, purposefully provocative. So basically, what and not for the first time in his career. No, indeed. Um, um, but on this particular point, because we can't, in this short space of 45 minutes, deal with Mr. Livingston's entire career, uh, I'm afraid. Um, in respect of what he said on this issue, um, you are quite certain that those are anti-Semitic remarks? I'm absolutely certain that they were intended to offend and they were anti-Semitic because uh, whether or not he intended it, about which there may be speculation, uh, what he said in trying to say that Jews were like uh, Nazis uh, is something that is plainly anti-Semitic and uh, I... I find it astonishing they could have made those remarks and still stand by them. And anyone who exhibits that sort of bigotry, uh, I, I think, is clearly anti-Semitic, and uh, his views are utterly repellent to our community. Uh, and if he was to say anything like, like that about any other people, I think he would be labelled a political pariah, and that's what I think he is. But you went on further to say that um, the recent changes in the leadership of the Labour Party um, meant that there now, these voices can now come out as if to, to, to suggest that they already exist in the political mainstream. Because when you talk about the Labour Party, you're talking about the political mainstream, not a fringe party. Uh, they are the opposition uh, in, uh, in the current parliament. Um, do you believe that the political parties in total ha have a problem with uh, anti-Semitism, or do you just think it's the Labour Party? Because we will be hearing from the leader of the Labour Party. He's agreed to give evidence to us in two weeks' time. So we've put that to him. We're hearing from the leader of the Scottish Nationalist Party after you, and we're awaiting the Prime Minister's reply. Do you think that there are these voices in all the political parties, or is it exclusively, in your view, the Labour Party? It's mainly, lately, in the Labour Party, witness the fact that there have been some 50 suspensions pending disciplinary proceedings, and the identity and party political affiliation of those who have uh, been making statements that have reached the public eye recently are from uh, members of the Labour Party. And it, I don't know whether you saw the comments of the President of the NUS um, who, who described Birmingham University as a Zionist outpost in higher education mm -hmm. and attacked Zionist-led media outlets. Mm -hmm. That would be way off your scale in terms of describing it as anti-Semitic, I assume. Yes, absolutely. Um, the myth, uh, the trope of Zionist or Jewish control of the media is a, a, a trope that goes back a thousand years. We're well used to it. We recognize it when we see it. Anything that attributes to Jews some sort of sinister control or motive or that Jews are responsible for the ills of the world, now the accusation is that Israel is responsible for all the troubles of the world. Things which people used to say about the Jewish people, they now say about the world's only Jewish state. Finally for me, tell me where this all ends. Political leaders, um, either present or former political leaders or whatever, making these kinds of statements. What do you fear about the statements being made by those who come from the political mainstream? Where does it end for the Jewish community in Britain? Well, it doesn't end with the Jewish community. History has shown us that people who start with the Jews, it never ends with the Jews. It's normally a sign of some greater ill in society. 
that people feel they can pick on are rather small uh, uh, numerically sized people who have long been the objects of prejudice. Uh, I'm actually confident that um, this and the fact that people in this country are rightly concerned about it, uh, uh, including this committee, uh, and I thank you for looking at it for, and for inviting me, uh, I think it will expose some unpleasantness in our society that all political leaders, uh, if they were acting responsibly, and I'm confident that they will, will do everything they can to put a stop to. So parties, I would expect to have clear codes of conduct so that everybody knows where they stand. And if someone breaks that code of conduct, there will be sanctions within the party. I'm confident we'll end up in a better place. Thank you. Tim Norton and then Vicky Atkins. Sorry, Mr. Joe Wardner, my apologies. Uh, thank, thank you, Joe, and thank you for calling me early. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, you have to leave. Uh, my apologies. Mr. Armkush, is anti Zionism rapidly becoming the Trojan horse for anti Semitism? Uh, yes, I think that's one way of putting it. Um, Chief Rabbi, uh, former Chief Rabbi Lord Sachs, said that today you can be as anti Semitic as you like and never, have to, never use the word Jew. Mm. And, and uh, though I'm sure they don't reflect the uh, position of the member for Murray, uh, he'll be giving us. Uh, uh, his uh, thoughts uh, later. Um, while there are so many conflicts across the world, uh, within the Scottish Parliament, the spotlight does seem to always be on Israel. Mm -hmm. I searched the records of the Scottish Parliament's most recent session from May 2011 to March 2016 and found that during this period there were 39 motions lodged by MSPs about the state of Israel compared to 26 about Syria, mm -hmm. 16 about Iraq, uh, just six about Iran and only four about North Korea. Um, the majority of the motions related to Israel were undoubtedly critical. Um, now, while no one, and you included, would argue that Israel should be immune from criticism, um, I, I think we have to ask this question, don't we? Why this disproportionate focus on Israel? Is it because it's the world's only Jewish state? Well, that's exactly the question which we ask as well. And um, it, Take, turning to Labour, um, many of us would argue that Labour's problem starts at the very top of this party. Uh, many in Labour's leadership today have spent their entire political lives cozying up to anti-Semites and terrorist groups uh, that express genocidal intent against the Jewish people and they've worked closely with Holocaust deniers, praised anti-Semitic extremists and described Hamas and Hezbollah as friends. Uh, do, do you believe that the inquiry that they're conducting will be enough to re-establish Labour's credibility on this issue? And if not, what further action would you deem necessary to rebuild trust? Um, well, I want to say first of all that the Board of Deputies of British Jews is not a party political organisation uh, with no party political affiliations uh, and we are solely interested in the well-being of the country's Jewish community. Um, we are concerned that leadership comes from the top. We are concerned that the leader of the Labour Party has uh, met Hamas and Hezbollah right here in the House of Commons, uh, not in the guise of peacemaking, but in, uh, at a reception which was about the, uh, uh, celebrating the resistance, and he's called them friends, and that despite my many requests to him, both, both face to face, when I had a very good meeting with him, and he's a very, very engaging man, but I wasn't able to get him to accept that those meetings were inappropriate or to say that they would not be repeated. And I really am waiting him to say, for him to say that. That's helpful. Um, uh, last question, Chairman. Uh, Shami Chakrabarti, who's been tasked with chairing Labour's inquiry, said, has said she will not seek evidence from uh, Ken Livingston, the former Labour London Mayor whose suspension from the party triggered this, what can only be called a crisis within the Labour Party. Um, what's your assessment of that? We met Ch Shami Chakravarti this morning as it happened. Uh, the uh, main Jewish communal bodies organised a round table for her uh, where she could ask whatever question she wanted and have a discussion. And I was present for most of that meeting and we had a very good discussion. And I would like to place as much confidence as I possibly can in Shami Chakrabarti and her team. I think um, it's right that Labour should be given credit for setting up the inquiry. 
and the Jewish community hopes with anticipation that the inquiry will fulfil its remit, will draw clear lines between what is acceptable political behaviour and what is not, and where the behaviour has crossed a line, that there will be a clear and rigorous and fair system for responding to it. But on, that, on the point I asked, is it acceptable, is it right, that the comments that triggered this crisis in the Labour Party will not be looked at by interviewing the person who said them? Well, I think that's probably a question for her. I, I'm, not, I'm not aware that she wasn't going to ask him. Uh, What's your assessment, though? What do you think it is right that the person who made these comments, who triggered this crisis in the Labour Party, will not be interviewed by the Labour Party's own inquiry? Well, his comments were so abhorrent and offensive, and he has repeatedly uh, sought to justify them, that I can well understand that someone might reach the conclusion that having him along to uh, have another opportunity to grandstand would not be conducive. Thank you very much. Um, David Winnick. Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury gave evidence last week on migration crisis, and he was asked uh, um, about uh, uh, feelings felt against Muslims and against Jews. Are you aware that when he referred to the Jewish people, he said, we have to recognise, and I'm quoting from the distinguished uh, Archbishop Canterbury, we have to recognise that anti-Semitism has been the root and origin of most racist behaviour for the past thousand years in this country. Uh, that is a view which obviously you fully endorse. Well, um, Jews have been part of the fabric of this country since Roman times, so probably going back 2,000 years. As a matter of history, in 1290, yes, he missed uh, that out. Jews were expelled. <laughs> so that between 1290 and approximately 1665, there weren't any Jews in this country, at least officially. Having said that, there was undoubtedly some Jewish prejudice in this country. You can see it come out in some of the works of Shakespeare. And since the 1660s, uh, Jews have been uh, perhaps a very readily identifiable minority in this country, but I wouldn't say they were the only source of prejudice. At times, there has been prejudice, no doubt, against the Irish, Asian people, and various others. No doubt, uh, and deplorable in all instances. Um, and of course, not only missed out 1290 inadvertently, but also what happened um, in Lincoln and York in 1190, mm. which will be familiar to mm. you. But he went on to say, we had a shameful record as regarding the church until very recently in historical terms. Is, not, is that not a welcome um, a, a, a recognition by the leading uh, Church of England uh, clergyman of the involvement of the church, unfortunately, as well as other Christian churches, in anti-Semitism and general prejudice against Jews, accusing them of being responsible for the uh, death of a saviour of the Christians. I think it is, and historically, sadly, one of the greatest sources of persecution of Jews has come from the church. Not the case today, let me uh, hasten to say. Now, when it comes to uh, the difficulties uh, of security, uh, it would it be right to say that the situation is that there can hardly now be a synagogue or a, um, a Jewish school which doesn't take the necessary precautions and with every possible justification? I'm afraid that is right. Uh, my synagogue typically, uh, if they have um, a brownie pack meeting, any activity at all in uh, a Jewish uh, place of worship or communal centre has to have security guards outside. With Jewish schools, there's another level of security altogether, and uh, sadly, some of them are beginning to look like fortresses. And if we don't get a grip on this problem, we might end up, uh, heaven forbid, like you see in France, where uh, Every Jewish communal institution looks like a fortress guarded by the army carrying heavy weaponry, which is very, very intimidating. Now, you've been uh, understandably critical of certain remarks made by the Labour Party. The chair has referred to the inquiry which is taking place. Would you not agree that the Labour Party, of course, uh, which I have the honour to be a member uh, now for 60 years, 
has had a long tradition, almost from the beginning. Indeed, the word almost is not necessary uh, to use, of um, full equality, needless to say, um, for people from minorities and certainly from Jews. Um, the Jews have had every opportunity within the Labour Party to stand for public office. I would agree. And that, if I can just finish the question, and that is certainly not true, we do not agree of the Conservative Party until, shall we say, the last 25 or 30 years. Well, I, I, I don't have enough historical knowledge, uh, and the board, as I say, is not a party political organisation, uh, but I would certainly agree with you that the Jewish community's ties with the Labour Party uh, run very, very deep indeed, and just looking, catching my eyes, the picture of Harold Wilson there, who was uh, very friendly towards the Jewish community and the State of Israel. And uh, that is why the Jewish community feels such, I can honestly say, anguish now um, that so many prominent members of the community have been long-standing members of the Labour Party for decades and now find themselves torn into such a difficult position. I mean, I don't know whether 50 years is too long a period to look at, uh, but following the 66 election, the Jewish Chronicle had a splash April the 8th, 1966, in which it referred to the number of Jewish MPs, which anti-Semites were certainly going to exaggerate and did. And then said, as far as Torahs are concerned, just two. Now, it's been said that perhaps I would have your comments that uh, future senior Tories like Lord Howe had a tremendous amount of difficulty in being um, selected for a safe Tory seat, uh, not because of his uh, politics um, or his ability, lack of ability, but simply because of his like, racial origin. So the point I'm saying, asking you if you would agree that compared to the Conservative Party, the Labour Party over a long period of time has had a, a, a policy as towards blacks and Asians of full equality and encouragement to join and be active in, in public life. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, all I can tell you is that um, I'm, I'm 61 years old and I grew up in Finchley. And from the time as long ago as I can remember, when I was certainly a teenager, uh, the Member of Parliament was uh, the Right Honourable Margaret Thatcher. She was a very deep friend of the community, and many local uh, distinguished members of the Jewish community uh, supported the party and had a home and had a home there. Uh, so I don't know how long you need to go back. I certainly do recall. I think it was um, a Prime Minister Macmillan's remark about, or someone made the remark about being more Estonians than Etonians in the party. So yes, there were prejudicial remarks then, but certainly for as long as. I can remember, and perhaps I'm, I'm not, as, not as old as, 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 as some might remember, um, I think that uh, there has been uh, a very strong uh, tradition of tolerance in the Conservative Party. But I think it's also fair to say, until relatively recent decades, uh, Jews were so overwhelmingly supportive of the Labour Party, they wouldn't naturally have stood for office in the, or stood for election in the Conservative Party. I think that might be part of the explanation. The last question I want to uh, ask is arising from what the Chair asked you about Israel. Now, you accept entirely that criticism of Israel is perfectly compatible um, with non-racism. It's not connected um, as of automatically in any way with uh, anti-Semitism. The criticism of Israel, as, uh, which could be very strong indeed, and some would say indeed by itself, often very much justified, is not anti-Semitic. I absolutely, if people criticise a policy of the State of Israel, it is not per se anti-Semitic. If someone only criticised the policies of the State of Israel and averted their eyes from genuinely gross abuses of human rights in, say, Syria or North Korea or Palestinian Authority for that matter or anywhere, then I would question what their motivation was. Now, if people justify anti-Semitism or try and justify prejudice against Jews, if not anti-Semitism, by referring to Israel, I mean, that's no more logical, am I not right, that those who criticise um, aspects of um, Islam, not only the terror groups, but 
what goes on in Saudi Arabia and other countries, uh, including uh, Iran, uh, in doing so. Uh, they're not being anti-Muslim. So that would be your position, wouldn't it? You, you can criticize Israel without being anti-Semitic in the same way that you can criticize Muslim countries without being accused of being anti-Muslim. Yes. Again, if you only criticise one, you know, sometimes it's instructive, instead of uh, using the word Jew, use the word black and see if you would reach the same conclusion. If you are only focused on one place to the exclusion of all the others, I do wonder. But in principle, yes, I agree with you. Thank, Thank you very much. Um, uh, Vicky.